So we talked about uh, compute, storage, security. The next topic is networking. So we have Thomas Graf from Cisco, and he's going to tell us about uh, uh, container networking and security. Thomas, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Is my mic on? Now it is, perfect. So I am Thomas, uh, I'm employed by Cisco. We're part of what Cisco calls an alpha project. We're called Noir on Arc. We have a, this is our logo right here. Um, we do crazy open source things. Uh, what I want to talk about to you about today is called a project called Cilium. It's an open source project that leverages BPF and XTP to implement container networking, or people refer to container networking, although I believe it's just networking in the end, and security policy enforcement. Um, BPF, who has heard about BPF? Who knows what BPF is? Okay, that's good. Those who haven't raised their hand have probably used it though. If you run TCP dump and you spe specify a filter, that filter gets translated into BPF bytecode, loaded into the Linux kernel, and then runs on every packet that goes to the AF packet. And that filter will say, should this packet go to user space and get displayed as part of DCP dump or not? So you've probably leveraged or used uh, BPF. Before I d dive into what is BPF and was it, what is Cilium and so on, I want to dive a little bit into what kind of problems, what kind of complexity uh, networking has to solve today, because essentially networking has become the new application bus. And it's not ideally the best environment to build an application bus, because today's network contains millions of endpoints, right? Um, eventually, the internet gets connect or con the internet connects everything together, and IoT brings tons of devices into a huge network that somehow can talk to each other. Um, networks are really, really noisy. Do you have any idea how many packets potentially fly on a wire for a, just a 10 gig NIC, 10 gig network? Any ideas? Uh, the networking guys are not allowed to say anything. It's 14 million, one four, 14 million packets per second. That gives you a budget of a couple of nanoseconds to actually do something with the packet. A single cache miss in memory can mess up your entire networking speed. So it's a really noisy environment. Now imagine debugging application issues in such a context. There's so much noise. How do you gain visibility? How do you gain introspection in such an environment? Networks are insecure. Like the last couple of talks exclusively focused on trust, uh, least privileged, um, all of that. Networks are not secure. Network hosts multiple tenants. How can we ensure that all tenants can, iter can operate in a, in a trusted and secure environment? Networks are unreliable, right? TCP provides you this feeling that everything will just work. It will retransmit automatically, but that comes at the cost, right? You have higher latency. If you have retransmissions, your services will take longer simply because some packets have to be retransmitted. Networks are constantly evolving. One good example is something called TCP Fast Open. So TCP Fast Open was uh, developed um, by Google among some other people, and it, it dramatically reduces the time it takes to fetch a website. So what happens if we, if we fetch a website? We open up an HTTP GET, or we send an HTTP GET, and then we send the GET, get request for all images and so on. Right? And for each of those, unless you are reusing connections, it will open up a new TCP connection. That takes, and it takes two round trip times before we can actually start sending uh, data. With TCP fast open, we can send a cookie inside the TCP. <laughs> we can send a cookie in the TCP uh, handshake, and we can, s we can, we can reduce the, the, the time to actually send data from two round trip t times to to one. This is awesome, and Google pushed that code into the upstream Linux kernel. But how does Google get all their Android vendors to actually rebase their kernel? They can't. It's a huge problem right now, and it's one of the reasons that is driving the vendors such as Facebook and Google and others to actually implement entire TCP stacks in user space simply for this reason. So we're dealing with um, a networking world that has evolving protocols. And we're, we're at the same time, we're dealing with vendors and users, customers and so on that are not willing or not capable of actually using 
the latest and greatest kernels. They're sometimes using years old kernels. Now the worst case scenario is that there's a flaw in TCP. There's a bug in the TCP parser. What could potentially happen? Well, if it's exploitable, somebody could actually like, shut down your entire data center. They could craft a packet, send it out, and all your, send, all your servers go down. There's this rumor out there that if, if Google is entirely shut down, like if all servers go down, they cannot restore it anymore. This is huge. This is, this is very difficult to solve, and this creates a lot, of, um, a lot of interesting problems that we need to solve on networking um, level. And this is why we, we focused on, on Cilium. And I will talk about the, the BPF part down here in the next slide. I want to give you guys some context on how this integrates with orchestration systems, Docker, and, and how, this, how is this related to distributed systems. So essentially, we have an agent running like everybody else. You have an agent running on each node. And that agent eventually programs the kernel to run BPF bytecode. I will, I will explain that in the next slide. Um, Integrating that with orchestration systems, we have a plugin level, a plugin layer. So you have a lib network plugin that will get notifications whenever a new network is created, when a, new, a container is attached to a network. Uh, we listen to the local Docker runtime events. So if a new container is actually started, we will, we will do policy stuff um, with CNI plugin and so on. So we will tie into orchestration system. You have a, a local CLI that allows you to Query the system and so on, but this is deep, deep, the debugging facing infrastructure, I would say. The, normally, a Cilium would, would not be visible to you. It would be a plugin that basically just does the networking for you. We have a policy repo. Um, so we have a, a repo that contains the networking policy. It's a pull model, so this could be a Git repo. Uh, for example, a Git, a Git repo with submodules. So you have an operator that defines the root policy, and then you can define submodules where Groups, development groups can define their own policy that get pulled, gets pulled in. That's up to you how you structure that. We basically we pull in policy on all nodes and then enforce that. Plus, we have a monitoring um, application or monitoring API that allows you to gain introspection into networking and into this application bus at very high speeds. The, 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 the bus here is the Linux perf ring buffer. Some of you might have used Linux perf. Perf allows you to trace um, system calls and what's going on in, inside the Linux kernel at a very, very high speed. So this, this per CPU ring buffer allows you to send samples from, user, from kernel space, user space, at millions, per, millions of samples per second. So it's a, a highly valuable monitoring system that we have connected um, to our BPF programs. The, the sole purpose of Cilium is actually to just connect the containers here on the, on, on the right to a network device. This could be an actual representation for a physical device, like an Ethero or something. Could be a VXLAN device that we don't really care. We connect uh, uh, containers to net devices, right? That's the purpose of, of Cilium. And we want to enforce security um, and provide load balancing at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about what is BPF. So as I said, BPF is actually a very old technology. It has been around since about 30 years. Um, but has recently been evolved and extended to support more than just basic filtering. Um, most of you might have heard of SecComp, right? SecComp leverages BPF as well to, to filter system calls. Chrome, for example, leverages BPF to whitelist the allowed system calls that every Chrome plugin can use. Um, Linux tracing uses P BPF to figure out if a sample should be sent to user space. So if you have a system called sample or a sim system called probe, a K-probe, firing off 100,000 times per second, you don't want to send all of these samples to user space. You might want to aggregate in the kernel and then send a summary to user space, right? Um, we can also apply BPF to networking now. And the way that's done is you can attach BPF programs to the TC layer. The TC layer is a traffic control layer. That's a, that's a layer that does QoS in the kernel. So for every packet that is either coming into a net device or going out the net, net device, you can, you can filter or you can pass that packet through a BPF program. So what is a BPF program? A BPF program is bytecode. Bytecode means it's instructions. The instruction set is based on the x86 assembly language. Um, and you have a kernel component that will interpret uh, the bytecode and execute it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an emulated um, 
an emulated environment, like a, like a Java, um, Java VM. Unlike a Java VM, or maybe I shouldn't say that because Java has a cheat compiler too, but it's not, you can run it in software, but you can also run it natively. So BPF has a, has a cheat compiler, a just-in-time compiler. So it will take the bytecode and actually translate that into the instructions the CPU itself understands. So even though you program the kernel with bytecode, with universal bytecode, it will later on run natively on your CPU. There is no performance penalty. So how is this any different from, let's say, a Linux kernel module, right? I can just, I can just load a Linux kernel module. The difference is, if you load the Linux kernel module and there is a bug, what, what will happen? It will crash your kernel, right? It's a worst case scenario. BPF has a so-called verifier. So if you load BPF bytecode into the kernel, the first thing the kernel will do, it will look at the bytecode and will figure out that it's absolutely safe and secure to run that BPF bytecode. You cannot expose kernel memory. You cannot create a loop that runs forever. You cannot you cannot dereference arbitrary memory pointers. Um, every single data that you access must be well defined. So it's impossible, unless there is a bug in the verifier, it is impossible to actually crash the kernel. So this is ideal to create something like a networking parser where a, a, a bug can potentially bring down your entire data center. So for those of you who are not really familiar with the Linux kernel, um, this slide actually cho kind of shows how packets go from the wire up to containers. So we have a NAT device, so packet will come up here, go to the TC layer. This is the TCP stack or the IP TCP stack of Linux. It goes into the socket. So in between here would be the network namespace switch where some form of forwarding happens that figures out to which container it goes to, switches the network namespace. The container receives it on a socket and sends, sends packets back out again switches back to the, the host namespace and they go out. There's multiple ways to configure this, but essentially we can attach ourselves to both the, the ingress, the incoming side, and the egress side, the outgoing side of any packet to a container and from a container. So BPF bytecode is like, it doesn't sound appealing to actually write in assembly-like language. Um, so naturally, a tool chain was created to actually simplify this. There's, there's several of them. One is called BCC, uh, which, where you can write Python code, which then gets translated into BPF bytecode. The one we leverage is the BPF backend to LLVM. So you can write C code up here, and then with LLVM Clang, you can translate that into bytecode and then attach it to the kernel. Why is, this, why is this awesome? I think this is actually the, the, the beautiful compromise between full unicorn and the old, kernel, the old traditional kernel model. Because what we do is, we don't just uh, generate BPF bytecode once. Whenever a container starts, we generate BPF bytecode exactly for that container. So the, the bytecode will only contain what is needed for that container. If the container does not need IPv4, we leave that out. If it doesn't need port, port mapping, we leave it out. If it can only do TCP, or if it only should TCP, then we, we only include the code that actually accepts TCP. So the bytecode or the data path will only include the, the minimal set of functionality that is required for that container. This, is, this reduces the attack surface of the code. Right? We own the entire space from the network device up into the container, and that, and that path is generated for each container and is as small as possible. It's also a lot faster, because instead of um, going through a lot of configuration options and paths, we know the exact configuration and simply hard code the entire path. A lot of the configuration, like MAC address, IP address, port mappings, they all become constants. It's not just memory or somewhere, it's, it's constants. The compiler will optimize that into the code. So you're essentially just loading a constant into your register and writing it into, into the packet. It's a lot less instructions in the end. Plus, we can regenerate this, dat this data path, this BPF program, at runtime while the container runs without losing any connections. So if there is a bug somewhere, if you need to change your data path, simply, simply regenerate it. So this is, this is almost too, too good to be true, right? You can update your kernel at runtime. You can bring in additional data, data functionality, for example, support for TCP fast open at some point without needing to re rebase your kernel, reboot your kernel without losing connections. 
One other angle that we, we really wanted to get into this project is IPv6 support. And the vision here is quite simple. Make all tasks globally addressable on the, on, on the internet. Why do we deal with IPv4 and NAT? We have to NAT everywhere. It's, it's, it, you, you get, create these huge diagrams with how things are connected, and it gets NATed here, and then it's a pain, right? You, in particular, if you have been involved with OpenStack at some point, this is what this was all about. It's, it's a huge mess that was created. And long term, it seems IPv6 would solve so many problems in terms of scale, addressing complexity, and just making all tasks globally addressable. It's, just, it's a huge opportunity. Um, it also allows you to simply defer all allocation to a host scope allocator. It's simple, right? Simply have a prefix per host per node and allocate out of that. It simplifies everything. All of a sudden, your address allocation scales much better because you don't have to synchronize between nodes. It also opens up the path for ILA. ILA is a concept that has been, it's been developed between, I'd say, Google and Facebook, and it's currently being deployed at Facebook. It, 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 it is a path to mobile or for, for tasks to become mobile. So ILA allows you to split an IPv6 address into an identifier and a locator. And your, your, your workloads will, will be able to move around in inside the data centers, and the network will automatically forward packets to always reach that, that endpoint. So if you have long-running batch jobs or tasks, you can, you can migrate them away from a, a machine, for example. Oh, and one, one thing I want to mention here as well. So we've built a um, NAT4.6 implementation. NAT4.6 is the mechanism from translating IPv4 frames to IPv6 or back. So this means if you have an IPv6 only application, and there are applications out there already which are IPv6 only, you, with, our, with Cilium you can run them um, in an IPv4 environment. And we will, with PPF bytecode, translate packets IPv4 packets, IPv6, and back. You can also run legacy IPv4 workloads in an IPv6-only environment. The next interesting aspect is how do we scale policy specification, right? All network operators are used to right now is specifying ACLs, so allowed port IP plus port combinations. In container environment, obviously, that doesn't, that doesn't scale. First of all, you don't even know all the IP addresses of your containers, and they change very fast. So why would that be a good choice? It also it doesn't work anymore to have, uh, to have firewalls somewhere. Your entire, every single node inside a data center needs to enforce security individually, right? Y there, is no, there is no barrier somewhere. Basically, you want to enforce security policy from and to anywhere. And the natural choice here is, is labels. Every orchestration system has some notation of label, Docker has labels. So what, let, let's just use labels for policy specification. So it's a very simple, very simple example right here. I'm just using like a local answer front and back end kind of ap application. And any of these, any of, like, you can have as many local answers, as many front ends, as many back ends. It doesn't matter. You assign a label, and then you specify a policy which says end user can talk to the local answer. So any container that has the label local answer, local answer to front end, front end to back end. And that's, th that's it. Cilium will do the rest to map that to, the, to your container label based policy to actual enforcement. And we're not mapping those to IP addresses. I will explain that in a bit. But we're actually mapping that to something that scales much better. So this is something that others do as well. What others don't do is we have this multi-dimensional level of, of label specification. So let's say you have your existing application and your application Dev group has specified that and is running that. Now you want to run that in multiple environments. Why don't we just allow to, to specify or define that environment with labels as well? So all, all it takes is basically to say anything that has the label production, any consumer of such a container also needs to have the label production. And any, la any, any workload with the label QA also, any consumer of that also needs to have the label QA. And all of a sudden, you have a multi-tenant environment, and it's completely decoupled from, from, from the policy, or from the application-specific policy. You could also say that an end user is never allowed to talk to anything that has the label QA. Very simple. So this would be your application. Uh, developer rules, and this would be operator kind of rules, I would say. Simple, right? 
how does this all scale? Because if you just translate that into IP tables rules, you get, you get a ton of rules, right? You get it's potentially a million of rules somehow that doesn't scale. So what we developed instead is we, we associate a cluster-wide unique ID for every unique label combination. So there is a, a key value store that we require that will capture all label combinations that occur and will associate a, a, a label ID. That label ID is then integrated, embedded into the network packet when a container sends out a packet. And we have multiple ways where that actually gets encapsulated. That could be in an encapsulation header, in a VXLAN header. That could be in the flow label ID. You might have your own protocol. Everybody's abusing protocol these days. So that could be anywhere. We were very flexible where it actually gets stored. But what it, what it ends up in is that at the receiving side, you, you know which container it's going to, so you know the label context of the receiver, and because the, the label context is embedded as, a, as an ID in the packet, all of a sudden you have both IDs, and it boils down to a single hash table lookup to figure out whether a consumer is allowed to talk to another, an, another container. So regardless of the complexity of the policy, regardless of how many endpoints you are running, the policy enforcement cost is always exactly the same. It's a single hash table lookup. We've done um, performance numbers, and we, we literally just increased the, the policy numbers from one to 200,000. The performance was simply always the same. You will see some hash collisions at some point, but they don't show up in numbers. Oh, this is a slide here. So this is a big one. Um, the safety guarantee by the verifier, this potentially, it's, there can still be a bug in the verifier, but the attack surface is much smaller. This can solve your hostile packet crashes entire data center um, scenario. Luckily, we, we didn't have major e exploits in, in the kernel, but we had UDP-related, for example, UDP-related flaws in the kernel that would allow you to crash your kernel with a crafted UDP packet. Let's, a public cloud provider allowing random people to run code in their data center, it's a, a, a potential option for them to basically allow a customer to crash their entire data center. That's, it's huge, that's a huge risk that we have to address. Um, Decoupling the actual functionality, the data path functionality from the kernel version is, is, is huge as well, right? As so at, at the point where your kernel has BPF functionality, and that obviously has uh, like a minimal kernel version uh, as well, but as soon as your kernel has the functionality, you can develop any functionality that you want, regardless of what kernel version you are running. This could be a way to upgra upgrade IoT devices, for example, because you don't need to load actual, you don't need to install a new kernel onto an IoT device. You can simply have a simple update mechanism that injects new bytecode, right? Um, and all of that at runtime. So I talked about the security aspect for now, but another good, a good one is um, gaining visibility into networking. There had, have, had been huge debates in the, in the upstream Linux kernel um, communities about Adi adding additional counters for, for particular like, network events. And everybody has their own requirements. They want an, 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 an additional counter if, if TCP does something like that. Um, and obviously, every counter comes at the cost. So usually, the, the answer is no. But you still need those. So BPF gives you a way to actually gain exactly the metrics and statistics that you want and that you need. And the beautiful thing is you, you enable them when you need them. So they're not just in the kernel because you need them at some point, you only compile them in when you actually need them. Um, <laughs> so scaling, <laughs> scaling the delivery of, of CAT. So <laughs> what is this about? So uh, it, to me, it seems that a huge purpose of a lot of infrastructure is built is actually just deliver, deliver some sort of media, videos or pictures of so, some sort. And the way that looks like, it's usually a very small HTTP request that comes in. And then it's a huge response, multiple, maybe gigabytes eventually, packets flowing back out. And if you have a local answer in front, and you're not doing anything at all, basically all packets have to flow back through your local answer, which means that as you grow your backends, you also need to grow your, your, fro your, your, your local answers, which ideally you don't want because you only need the local answer on the way in. You can do something like something called direct server return, which means packets flow in, and you have ECMP here, local answering tool, your local answers, and then the, the front end will send the packets or the reply directly back to the, to the users. 
very simple to do with BPF. There's other solutions that can, can do this as well. But with BPF, it's you can you can program this in however you, way you want. It's not something that um, you need to have specific functionality for. Um, this is built into into like the core BPF program that we built. So this is available at any point. This is available for north-south traffic. That's traffic that's coming from outside your data center. This is available for east-west, so server-to-server. -server. This is also available, uh, available for local container workloads. So if you want to localize locally but on one node between containers, it's all the same thing. To BPF, it's all, it's all exactly the same. Performance. Um, these are the best numbers <laughs> I, I, I can show you. So there's always a, um, we always have to be a little bit careful with regard to performance numbers. What we're seeing here is um, container to container performance on a single node. It's a 24 core uh, Intel Sandy Bridge. And it's basically sending packets from a local container to another local container. So there's no actual networking hardware involved here at all. It is. It is limited by memory bandwidth, context switches, and so on. It's leveraging TSO and GRO, so it's, it is creating large packets. We're seeing, as we scale up from one core to 22 cores, we're seeing we're running one flow per core. So we're running one flow here and then all the way to 22 flows. So we're, we're scaling up nicely. We're seeing about 70 gigabit of, of throughput or good put. Uh, for one flow, and then it scales up to 550 gigabits. So this is BPF. It allows you to transmit frames very fa very fast. As they go out the wire, obviously your network, your wire speed will, will obviously limit it quite quite a bit. But the solution itself is is is, is very fast, and this is with full policy enforcement. This is not just a a scenario that, that doesn't serve a real purpose. This is with 10,000 security policies loaded. It's not 10,000 ACLs, it's actually 10,000 label-to-label associations, which would eventually resolve in hundreds of thousands or, or the millions of, uh, of IB tables rules, for example. All right, I want to demonstrate what I just told you about, um, and then we can go into some Q&A as well. All right, so uh, big enough? So we're running in a Vagrant box here on my laptop. Um, I'm not going to type everything because I'm just too slow of typing, but the demo will run live. So what I want to show you here is um, how to actually debug a, connect a connectivity issue. So I'm starting two containers, um, and I'm attaching them to a network called Cilium that Docker Network is configured to B of type Cilium and I, um, driver Cilium and IPAM type Cilium. So it just invokes our, our plugin. We also give each container a label. Um, the first one is the server, the second one is the client. Um, we have not configured anything else. So this shows the, the Cilium CLI, so we can list the local endpoints. We're seeing two endpoints here. Uh, we're seeing the labels, we're seeing the IPv6 address, we're seeing the IPv4 address, and we're seeing the label ID. This is this cluster-wide unique ID that is associated for every unique label. Situation that you have is something like this, right? It's not working. At this point, you would probably start like TCP dumping or checking statistics. And it's, it's really hard because you need to know how what's actually how your networking looks like. With BPF, we give you uh, additional introspection or, or visibility. So I've split my screen, and on the bottom half is the Cilium monitor running. This is a very simple 100-line Go program that basically just listens on the perfring buffer and will display all events that are being sent. So we're, we're pinging again, and we're seeing that the monitor is throwing out um, messages. And it's saying, I have an event on CPU2, um, has a flow mark, has a the ID from which container it's coming from, and then a packet is dropped, and the reason is policy denied. And we see the size of the packet, we see the network if index, we see the, the, the label ID from and to, and we see the first 64 bytes of the packet header. And this is sent through the perfing buffer, so this could, this could receive millions of events per second. So you could run this in a production kind of workload environment. You don't need to fundamentally reproduce this in a, in a low-scale environment. You can run this in a high-speed environment. Um, 
So let's figure out why the policy is denied. So we're, we're tracing um, the, the policy repo, the policy um, store, to figure out what is client allowed to talk to server. So we're saying, what happens if I'm sending a packet from, from a label client to a label server? And it's saying here, mm, there's actually no rules loaded at all. So the reason is, we haven't actually loaded a policy. So let's lo load a policy. And for now, what policy we support is simple JSON. Um, that is a tree that allows you to basically say, this label can talk to this label. And the tree is so you can define precedence. Um, this policy allows client to talk to server, and it allows server to be reached by the, the local host. So the local node which hosts the container can reach into that, into that server container as well. So let's load that policy. Let's trace again. And it's actually now going through rules. And it's at the very bottom, it's saying, it's now accepted, right? So we can check if that is actually has been inserted into the kernel. So this reads the BPF, the BPF map, which is the data structure in the kernel, and it reads the policy for the, the server container. So this, um, this ID here is the endpoint ID for the server, and it's saying, I have, two, I have two allowed consumers, the host and the client, and it will actually collect statistics for those as well. So instead of having a connection tracking table for every IP or just uh, a global counter for every container, we actually collect statistics per allowed consumer, which is really what you want to see. You want to see like r statistics between services, not statistics between um, IPs. All right, so policy is loaded, right? So let's try again. Um, hmm. Still not working. Well, we're seeing like a different reason now. We see unsupported L3 protocol. Like, what's this? What's what's this about? Like uh, at this point, you would be stuck and you would call your vendor and say, I, "There's a bug, right?" Um, the vendor will then like I've been I've worked for a, for a kernel vendor for for a long time. I would I would probably send you a debug kernel with print case statements. That's how like not sure how, how many of you have done kernel development, but that's how how you debug a kernel. You you put in put in print K, which is like the printf version of print printf, and you. You compile a kernel, you boot it again, and you see if you can figure out what's going on. That's a very painful process. Right? What we're doing instead is um, we will simply compile in debug, debug statements in our BPF program. So what this does is it just recompiles the BPF bytecode with debug statements enabled. We do that for both containers. It's very fast. All of a sudden, our data path in the kernel has debugging statements. So let's ping again. And now you can see there is there is debug statements that are being printed. So this is the information that the kernel developer would usually gain through print K. And all of a sudden, that's possible in, in seconds. The containers are still running. So it's still the, uh, the original scenario. We haven't changed anything. We don't need to reproduce anything. All right, so let's look at the actual code, because apparently an unknown L3 protocol return error was returned. So this is the actual C code that generates the BPF bytecode. So I'm opening the, the template file on my VM, which is used as the source. So let's see where, um, where this unknown L3 is being returned. So let, this is the first, okay, let's see, this is a, a switch statement, then it handles L3, and then the default returns L3. That sounds reasonable, right? Um, this is the next one, so it would fix me, drop IPv6 packets, the intern guy. Hmm. That doesn't look right, right? So maybe somebody messed up, right? So it's dropping all IPv6 packets right after right after it was went through the policy engine. That doesn't look that doesn't look right. So let's let's remove that. So um, I'm removing that. I'm saving it. All I do now is recompile the endpoints. Containers are still running. And I'm ping again. Ooh, it's working. But we're still seeing the debug statements, right? We're still seeing um, this still causes cycles to be spent on something that we don't need anymore. So let's just compile out debugging. And we, it's working now. So let's also compile out drop notifications because we want the smallest minimal amount of code that is run per packet. Because remember, we're, we're receiving 40 million packets per second, right? So compiled out, ping again. It's working, but we, the bottom half screen is not working or is not showing anything because no, no events have been, have been sent out anymore. Um, that's it for the demo. <laughs> I, I
think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Could you please tell us a bit more about how the verifier works <laughs> and what technology is involved in there? Okay. Thank you. So the verifier is implemented in the kernel itself. And when you load a, a BPF bytecode, it will actually read through in each instruction and it will, will walk each possible branch the program can, can take and will verify that this is safe to run. So it, you can, for example, you can jump backwards in your program, but you cannot jump backwards in a way that will create a loop, for example. So you, because that could possibly stall your kernel. So it will look at each, it will verify each assembly instruction. Does that answer the, the question? Okay, <laughs> let me, let me. So, so I understood that far, but is it just uh, a bunch of heuristics or are you using uh, things from formal verification for this? Um, it, is, it is only looking at instructions and building up all and, and running through each possible option that the, 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 the program could, could take. You cannot have any external input that is undefined. Can, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Maybe, uh, th so I've, I have not written the verifier myself, but I can hook you up with, with the guy who actually wrote the verifier. He can probably give you a be much better answer. More questions? Go ahead, I'll repeat it for you. Question was, could we do TLS? Um, potentially at some point. So there's, BPF cannot do everything um, let me show, I think I have a slide here. Yeah, th this is the kind of the building blocks we have built so far in BPF. A couple of things are missing. For example, timers are missing. Um, there is no, there's no re real way to do loops right now. We're all working on that. So TLS eventually at some point. So somebody actually did um, a cipher implementation in BPF. And it was a very painful bro process, but they got it to work. But eventually, yes, it's just... BPF itself, the bytecode engine, needs to be extended to actually um, go to this point. The most fundamental limitation you have with BPF right now is that each program can be at most 4,000 instructions, and then you need to split it into multiple programs, which then tail call into each other. It's kind of a function call, right? Um, plus, the verifier has a, has a maximum, uh, massima, maximum complexity limit. Right? If, you, if you could load an arbitrarily complex program into the kernel and then the verifier takes 10 minutes to verify, you can, you can exploit the kernel, right? So there's a, a limit in terms of complexity that your program can, can have. But eventually there's no fundamental limitation that it would not allow to implement TLS at some point. Yeah. So let me, f let me just walk you through the, the workflow. So orchestration plugin tells us new container is being started. We get a request from libna.org. Um, we need to retrieve the labels for s uh, security policy purposes. Then we take the, the template file, the C file, which is the base program. Then we generate a header file, which contains all the container specific aspects, the configuration, all of that. We configure the port map. Then we invoke LLVM, Clang, to, to translate that into BPF bytecode. Then we use TC um, to load the bytecode into the kernel. The kernel verifies it. We attach it to the, a VTH pair, which, is, uh, which connects the container to the local stack. Yes? Yes, uh, there is, um, there's a lot of potential usages here, in particular storage, any sort of security enforcement at syscall level. Um, what we're discussing right now upstream is attachment of BPF programs to C groups. So meaning that whenever a task belonging to a C group sends or performs a system call or an operation on a socket, you can invoke a BPF program for that socket. So an external, right now you can attach a BPF program to a socket, but you need to attach it to your own socket. 
And with cgroups integration, you will be able to attach a, a BPF program to other sockets that you orchestrate, but to, that are not, they don't belong to your own application. So that will allow you to, to do any sort of um, security enforcement or maybe even um, a rewriting of API calls at system call level. There's a lot of options out there how BPF could be leveraged eventually. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>